Okay, so here we are with day two of our training. Again, my name is Hilary Stupa, and I'm a developer with Qdabra Software, and we're going to continue on with our Q Rules training today. Um, I had emailed everyone and asked for a quick vote on the agenda for tomorrow. I was a little surprised because it turned out to be a bit of a squeaker uh, between term sets and encrypt, decrypt. And I gave it some thought last night, and I looked at what I've got for slides tomorrow and I think we can fit both of them in. So that's what we're going to do. I might cut down a little bit on the presentation time to make sure we've got time for both the labs, but I, I wanted to make sure everybody got to, uh, to do both of these things. So I think we're going to go ahead and just fit both of them in. Um, the agenda tomorrow was kind of short because the last section doesn't also have a lab, the, uh, the discussion on best practices for browser forms. And if I recall correctly from the last time I did the training, we finished up kind of early on the third day. So we'll get both of those in. And and that way, um, everybody wins. So moving along here. And today, our first lab is going to be on template parts. And we're going to talk about template parts for a bit. Now, I don't know if anybody has taken advantage of template parts much. They have their pluses and their minuses. Um, to me, the pluses are reusability. I, I mean, that is the that is the huge plus right there. Your template part allows you to create some basic uh, form pieces that you can easily put together in order to uh, uh, make your form development quicker and more standardized. And so, it's it is a type of a building block, which is very useful. Um, and the minuses that I see in template parts is that they can be a little finicky. Um, I've, I've run into some namespace issues occasionally in them, some odd errors where all of a sudden I couldn't save my template part when I was doing something that I didn't consider to really be non-standard form development. So um, with template parts like InfoPath Form Services and Browser Forms, my suggestion to everyone is test early, test often, um, you know, save it frequently, um, make sure that the thing is robust because I have had some incidences where I've added a data connection to a template part and all of a sudden it would no longer save for me. So just it's just something to keep in mind. That said, uh, they can save you a lot of valuable time. And again, for standardization, they can't be beat. If you are working with a few other people in your team that develop forms, um, well, obviously, we can't all work on the same InfoPath form at the same time, right? One person has to close it, the other person open it. And so template parts can be something you can provide other form designers that allows them to, to develop forms that are very similar to what you're working on, make forms that, that look standardized according to your company's look and feel, and so on. Um, so, you know, a typical template part is going to have some controls and a data source and may also include features such as data connections, data validation, and rules. I'm going uh, I'm going to show you a few different template parts that uh, we have that we use frequently. We've got like a contact block that we use in, in a few different forms. We have um, an assignment uh, widget kind of a thing that we use in a few different forms and, and so forth. So, so I'll show you a few of those. Now, this is Q rules training, and so when we use a template part, you know what, you guys, I haven't been sharing my screen. <laughs> Let me go ahead and push a play here. It's going to be a, another Monday. Um, I'm going to go back one slide just so we get that captured in the recording. So this was the first slide that nobody got to see because I had forgotten to push the play button. And here is the second slide, the one we're on right now. So template parts and Q rules. Um, the issue with template parts and Q rules is that we end up with some issues with uh, data sources and we end up with some issues with DLLs. So if you inject your form with Q rules, your template part with Q rules, you can test it in preview, which is useful, but then when you go to use your template part, you have to change it to use the correct data source. Um, and adding a template part to a form can change node names and data source names. And we're gonna, I'm going to show you that. And since you're going to have to do some cleanup anyway, it's simplest to use dummy nodes for your rules in your template part and then just change them to use the form nodes after adding the template part to your form. And that's what we'll have you do in the lab so you'll, you'll get a better understanding of that with Q rules. And I'm going to, um, 
I'm going to demo kind of what happens when we inject a, a template part with QRules and then we add it to a form. And then you can add directions for usage to the template part to make the modifications easier. I think this is our lab slides. So we're just going to pop back here and I'm going to, um, first off I want to show you a few template parts. So I'm going to pop open um, Visual Studio here and pull a couple down from source control. This is going to take a second to load up and show you a few that we've got uh, stored away in our in our repository. Just like that. Okay. And so I think once again I'm showing everybody my file system. It's just disturbing. I think solutions template parts. Let's just grab the latest. And while that's downloading, oh, we're downloaded. Oh, there's just one. That's great. Windows Explorer. We'll take a look at this one. So one thing you're going to notice about template parts is no right click and design. You have to actually open InfoPath and navigate to them. Um, I find that annoying, but then, <laughs> but then I'm not known for for finding things pleasing. Frequently, these little things annoy me. So off we go to our folder. And you can see we don't see anything here. That's because this is set to XSN and XSF by default. We changed it to template parts and now we can open it. XTP is Windows 2007 compatible. XTP2 is InfoPath uh, 2010 compatible. And I think I might have said Windows a second ago. I meant InfoPath 2007 and InfoPath 2010. Uh, so XTP2 is InfoPath 2010. If you've got any users uh, who are using InfoPath 2007, then you want to use uh, XTP. If you've got all 2010 or greater users, you want to use XTP2. So here's a sample of one of our um, simple template parts that we use a lot. We've got a little customer contact block. It's got a little a little search method. You can enter a search term and tab out. Uh, you can select from a company drop down. It looks like we've got two different drop downs here that are probably conditionally formatted. Yeah, one if you're searching, one if you're not um, because of the different filtering. And we've got contact information that you can use after you select a company name. Uh, we've got these little uh, little hyperlinks here that, ah, come on, let me click you. These little hyperlinks here that, that uh, include information like um, a full link to allow you to Skype call and so on because we use Skype internally a lot. We, we use link a little more now. Uh, if you go manage data connections, we've got um, search for companies. That's one of our web services that we're using to, to search. Uh, we've got a query and another query. So we go ahead and close this and we preview it. Right. And here I can enter a search term and tab out and then I've got the other controls available to me. So the or I can I can list all. So if I search for Kadabra, our own company, it's gonna connect. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not signed in. So let me do that real quick. It's just a morning of, of miniature disasters for me here. So um, let's pop over here and I have to get my sign-in information because that's not anything I happen to be storing in my head. And let's just get that taken care of. Okay. So the web service is going to return results for this search and we can see I've got a little I've got a little drop down that apparently isn't working doesn't look filtered at all um, <laughs> and if I select a company then I can select a customer and so on at any rate my point here was my 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 poorly displayed point was simply that you can you can see how in a number of internal forms you might want to have customer contact information for us for example we would want this in the statement of work form we want it in our purchase order form. We may want it in our invoice request form. We would definitely want it in our customer support form. So that's easily four internal process forms that we use where we would want the same customer contact information available to us. And there might be others as well. There could be uh, 
you know, I could see how it could come in handy in a download request form or some things of that nature as well. Maybe some sales tracking, a customer contact form. Um, so there's there's all kinds of different forms that we could reuse this same simple piece. And rather than recreate it every single time, using a template part gives us that option. Now, if we make a new template part and we inject it with QRoles. We're gonna, I'm going to do that real quick. InfoPath Designer, Template Parts. So there's Blank, which is browser compatible. There's uh, Blank InfoPath Filler, which is filler compatible. And I haven't created one before in InfoPath 2013. So um, I'll be interested to see what happens with, uh, with this as far as, as when I go to save it what format it saves in. So I'm going to do a save as, and you can see it's defaulting to XTP2, but it looks like I'm allowed to select different compatibility here. So while uh, when I create it, I was only allowed 2010, it looked like by default to create it. It looks like the other compatibility options are still available to me. And I'm going to leave this as it is and just save it. And I'm going to close it and inject it with QRoles. And Pick a QRoles injector. I've got um, I've got both installed on my machine right now, and my temp folder. Off we go. Drop, inject. Okay, okay, and close that. So now I'm going to design this again. I can't do it that way. Let's open up InfoPath again. See if it's still hanging out here in my recents. It is very good news. Okay. <laughs> And I'll just drag my Qdaba rules stuff over. Just a few things, right? Command, result, error. Okay, that's enough for us to test with. That's all we really need. We preview it, and we use our friend generate GWID, easiest command of them all. And you can see we get a result back. So this is perfect. This is my brand new fancy GWID generating template part. And I'm going to save it. I'm going to close it. And then I'm going to add him as a custom control. So I'm going to do a new filler form, design. Um, and if I check up here, add or remove custom controls, do add. I'm going to add a template part. And we're going to browse. And it looks like we're still in InfoPath 2013. We can use XTP or XTP2. I'll go to my handy temp folder here, open him up and finish and close and OK. So I'm going to add that template part here to my to my fine looking form. And you know with your template part you can do things like you can add uh, a different you know a, a name, you can add an icon and things of that nature as well but ours is just ours is just stock standard. OK so here's our template part, here's our data source. Now you can see because we already had a my fields group our template source, our template parts data source, my fields got renamed to my fields underscore one. Okay, so that's one thing to notice right off the bat is our data source name got changed. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing, if we go look at our Qdaba rules data source, it's now Qdaba rules underscore template part one. Let's preview this and see what happens. All right, no result. Now, I would be assuming that the reason there's no result is because QRules executes on the Qdaba rules data source. And we don't have a Qdaba rules data source anymore, right? Also, let's see what our form template looks like here with this guy injected. Let's do a save as. And I'm just going to save him in temp as form one, overriding my previous form one. Overwrite him. And here we go to temp again. My uh, my temp file, I have a PowerShell script that runs every Friday at noon and empties this thing. So it, it makes a great little place to put stuff that I, oh yeah, I know, that I don't really want to save. Every now and again I, I make a mistake and something I'm working on stays in temp and I've, I've paid a horrible price a time or two for my, my automation. Okay, so we looked at what was injected with a, with a Q rules injected form. We looked at that um, yesterday. And so we're missing something here, right? We're missing the Qdaba rules DLL. That's gone entirely. Okay. So if we now re-inject this form again, I keep like switching which injector I use. Oh, now I pinned that one. Fantastic. Let's inject again. Okay. 
All right, now we've got our code DLL, so that's fantastic. So one thing we noticed is our code DLL did not come along with our template part when we, in, when we added our template part to our form. So that right there means the, the template has to then be re-injected. So now let's go take a look and see what we've got going on here. Oh, look at that. The XML schema file specified cannot be used. So when we re-inject it with having the QDABA rules data source already there in the form, we ended up with a corruption. We had something go wrong. Okay, so because of all of these issues that we're going to have, and you can manually clean up the manifest, but at this point, you're, you're in pretty deep as far as time investment goes, right? At this point, you're kind of already in this scenario where, oh my goodness, I can't hand this template part to anybody and ask them to use it, right? It's just too problematic with the, with the issues of injection, the issues of data source renaming, the issues of the DLL not being included with our template part. All of those things compound into a scenario where we lose the value of template parts altogether. Right, because our value was saves me time, makes things easier for others. It's like, well, this just lost all of its ease and convenience, didn't it? So this is why we suggest that you use some dummy nodes and then you set the and then you set the form nodes after you add your template part to the form. And you're gonna find that in the lab. Let's see where we're at. It's gonna be lab four today. You're gonna find that in the lab that we're setting uh, <laughs> I keep doing this like I'm like I'm expecting a different result, right? I keep I keep copying that um I keep right clicking that and thinking I'm going to be able to open it in design mode and I cannot. I find this enormously frustrating. And of course then I get here and I don't see it and I have to change this. It's like you almost wonder, InfoPath team, were you trying to make this hard for us? Okay, and so you'll find this one, this one's in your lab, this is one of the template parts for the lab, and you'll find this, that, that we're including usage instructions. And so what we generally do anymore is we add a little group and we call it, you know, uh, delete me, temp delete, something like that, and we tell people, you know, after you add the template part, go ahead and delete this group after you followed the other instructions. And so we've got rules here on date two, and date two is using uh, it's setting a field's value, but it's setting the command field here in temp delete, not the command field in the QDABA rules data source. So when I add this template part to my form that's been injected with QRules, all I have to do is follow my directions here and change this field from this to the command field in the QRules data source, right? And change my result field here to the result field in the QRules data source. So we found internally at least that template parts with QRules are great if you don't add the QRules to the template part. Now, when you're new with QRules, it's very possible that you're going to make a mistake in your commands. So you might want to take a form and use a form to start with that's QRules injected and make sure your command syntax is correct. Conversely, you might find it's not that difficult to get your commands in order without being able to actually preview and execute them and then just do a quick unit test inside of a form, make any changes you need to to the template part. It really just kind of varies according to your level of confidence with QRules and, and how much you've used it. If you're new, and you're still kind of green and you, you know you make some mistakes, uh, you know, get your logic set up you know, in your form. Get your basic template part put together maybe, get your data source put together, inject it in your form, figure out your rules in the form, and then go back and put those rules on the fields in the, in the template part using your dummy fields. Okay, so be aware of your capabilities, be aware of what you know and how confident you are. Now I am not a confident form developer. I'm pretty confident with QRules and I'm pretty confident with the stuff I finally end up with, but when I'm in process, when I'm actually working through something, I am not one of those designers who sits down, puts a bunch of stuff in place and just assumes it's going to work and then previews it and like magic everything works. I mean, I am like, do two steps, preview the form, save my work. Do two steps, preview the form, save my work. I am neurotic. And, and so if you're at all neurotic like I am, you may find you're more comfortable doing some of your rule work in a form that has your template part in injected and then you can just copy your syntax back over. At any rate, we're going to go ahead and go to the lab um, and the lab is in your lab files and the SharePoint site, the training site that we were in yesterday, it's lab four. We're not going to, uh, let me see if I can pop open the training site just to remind everybody. 
and this is right here. So here we are, and it's under Documents, and it's under Lab 4. And um, I'd like to get back together in about 25 minutes. Actually, yeah, let's do let's do 25 minutes. So that makes 9:45. So uh, that gives you 25 minutes to work on the lab. We'll reconvene because our next lab is longer. It's um, our next presentation is longer, and the lab is longer. It's uh, submit to SharePoint list, and so I want to make sure we've got plenty of time for that. And so I will uh, pause recording and be quiet so you can work on your lab. If you have any questions. Uh, please feel free to pop them into the question window. I'll be keeping an eye on that. And then we will start again here it, at uh, 9.45. Again. Okay, so this module is on key rules in SharePoint lists. And we're going to uh, talk about how key rules works with SharePoint lists. And then that's what the lab is also going to be on is, is key rules with SharePoint lists. So yesterday, um, we copied some data from SharePoint into our main data source when, when we did our, our copying uh, lab. And today, we're going to save form data back to a SharePoint list. So a few things about submit to SharePoint list that I see uh, continually kind of crop up in the forms when people start using this command. First off, don't feel um, <laughs> don't ever feel like you're slow if you struggle with this command the first time you use it or the second time or the third time. It's complicated. It's not easy. Um, the reason it's not easy is because there's a lot of moving parts here. You know, there's no magic. We can't guess anything. We have to know where we're submitting to. And, and getting data into a SharePoint list can be complicated if you're using anything but straight text. And it, it can require some, some somewhat esoteric knowledge that none of us just start out knowing. And so um, this command can be complex and and so don't feel uh, frustrated with it if you struggle with it at first I encourage people to start simply with it use a simple list that just has a couple of plain text fields get things working and then sort of expand your solution from there because I think simple early successes that give us something to build on uh, give us some confidence with the command and then all of a sudden we realize that it's not quite as as intimidating as it can seem so first off You've got to submit data from your main data source. We don't currently have anything in the command for submitting data from a secondary data source. We've got a long-standing uh, case in our in our bug tracker for that. It's one of those things we would like to add at some point because it does seem as if there would be some usefulness to be able to submit secondary data to your SharePoint list. However, at this time, it has to be in your main data source. Now, that doesn't mean you can't use one of the copy techniques we talked about to copy the data into your main data source. And and it certainly doesn't mean you have to store that data in your main data source after you successfully submit it. So if you have data in another list that you want to submit to this list, you could, at least in theory, copy that data into your main data source, submit it to your SharePoint list, and then delete it from your main data source. Okay, so, so while that's a bit of a block, there's a definite workaround path to that. Now, this command uses a submit data connection, and that means that your form data has to be in a valid state before you execute the command. If you try in InvoPath to execute a submit when your form data is invalid, if you've got any validation errors, that submit's going to fail, right? And this QRules command is, is no different. Now, we could have uh, force cleared the errors in the form prior to executing the submit, but there's no way to restore those errors after clearing them. So that would have been kind of draconian. We certainly don't want to do that. So generally speaking, you want to uh, submit your form data when you're submitting your other data. So if you're submitting your XML to a form library, you'd submit your form data to SharePoint at the same time. You do have the option with QRules to execute the clear errors command, but again, that clears the error board and you can't, uh, you're not going to be able to, to reinstate those errors until they're, they're re-triggered. You have to close the form and start over. Um, another option would be to have all of your validation be custom validation rules and use some sort of a, a logic field to help you understand uh, programmatically when you want to have validation be active. And so it could be that you have uh, 
a little helper field called is submitting to SharePoint list and prior to executing the submit to SharePoint list command you set that field to true and your form validation is all based on that field not being true. Again, some of this is somewhat theoretically theoretical. I haven't sat down and walked through that scenario, but, but thinking of it, it, it occurs to me that that would most likely work. So if you're in a scenario where you have to submit your form data to SharePoint without the rest of the form being valid, custom validation might be a way to go there. As of 4.2, you can map your list ID field and your attachment field to simplify the command. So Originally, this command had a lot of parameters that you had to include. Um, as of 4.2, we have quite a few uh, fewer parameters. If you are using an earlier version of Q rules, I think in our lab uh, we have a starter form that has uh, a 4.3 trial injected in it, so you'll want to use um, that form. Let me just make sure I'm not a liar as I sometimes am. No, it looks like this is our completed form. Uh, at the same point in time, you, you might just, just give me a holler, ping me if you're not using at least 4.2 and I'll get you a form with, uh, with 4.3 injected in it, get you going for the lab with that because um, this is, uh, well, I guess you'd need the mapping tool too. So if you're using a previous version than 4.2, please let me know and I will get you the old lab materials that, that use earlier versions. How about that? Um, so as of 4.2, we include uh, the ID field and the attachment field. You can include that in the mapping. We left the command backward compatible. So if you have a form that uses submit to SharePoint list and you created it back in version 3.1 or something like that, you can inject it with 4.3 and your command will still work. It just means going forward you have an easier path. Um, if you are doing a parent-child relationship, and you've got repeating child data and that's what you've mapped, you can use a relative path for the parent information and we're going to actually walk through that a little bit in a demo as well as we're going to look at the, the mapping form because I just want to talk a little specifically about some of the changes there. And finally, if your lists have lookups, you need to submit the item ID for the lookup item. If they're a choice, you have to submit a valid item. You're going to get an error if you have a list and it's called orders and it has a field in it that's a lookup to your customers, uh, to your customers list and you try to submit an, an, a value that isn't valid. Um, the syntax for a lookup is usually, let me pop into something different here, is usually um, ID so your number, semicolon, pound, and your text. Let's spell that right, okay? However, with lookups in general, we can also submit just the ID. So if you know the ID, you can submit it. You can submit three or four or five. Now, for most of us, that works out pretty well, right? Because we're going to give users a drop down to select their customer, and it's going to have data from the customer list, and all we've got to do is make sure the value is set to the customer ID, and then we submit that ID. Um, person or group pickers can become a little more problematic. If you've got a people or person or group data type in your SharePoint list, um, the syntax uh, is a little bit different. Um, there's some posts on InfoPath Dev about that, and while you guys are doing the lab, I'll grab a link to a few of them so you guys can see those. Um, if I recall correctly, you can submit if you know the user ID, but you do not if you know the user alias, but you do not know the user's SharePoint ID, so you don't know whether they're user number 10 or 11 or 12, which let's face it, most of us don't, and your person or group picker in InfoPath is not going to help you out because it's just mean. Um, the syntax, I believe, is negative one semicolon pound, and then your user alias. So the negative one says, look the user up, right? and then that is the alias that gets looked up. And I will, uh, I'll look up those URLs and make sure I've got those when we, when we uh, get back together after you guys do the lab so that you've got that because person or group pickers are a little, are a little picky. Uh, date and time can be picky too. Um, let me pop back into my text editor here since I'm just incapable of typing anywhere else or thinking without typing. Um, calendars. A uh, calendar date time includes a Z in it, so it has like um, 2013-01-14, uh, and then I think it's T, 
uh, hour, hour, minute, minute, second, second, Z, or something crazy like that. And I'll look that one up as well, so I've got that information for you when you come back. But again, those are some of our edge cases that can be problematic with submit to SharePoint lists. And they're edge cases you need to be aware of because when you go and try to execute this command and it fails because your data isn't what it's expecting, um, it can be helpful to know that, that you need to keep an eye out for these data types. Um, one way you can see what SharePoint wants is by using an OWSSVR data connection and that'll return the data in the list in an XML format for you and then you can inspect that data in a text editor and you can say oh that's what that data looks like and that'll give you a good idea of what you need to submit. Sometimes I create a helper field that just simply uh, has a default value that gets me my data kind of compiled together in the format I need in order to be able to submit it because uh, for example, your InfoPath date time isn't going to have a Z at the end of it, but your calendar is going to want a Z. And it's just the calendar that wants that specific, uh, specific format, which is um, very exciting and crazy stuff. So the ID parameter sometimes causes some people confusion as well. Now again, as of 4.2 and going forward, you don't have to include the ID parameter anymore. You can just map your ID and indicate it. Um, with the ID parameter, if you are mapping a repeating group, then the ID needs to be a relative path. If you are mapping a non-repeating group, then the ID needs to be the full path, the absolute path to the field. You do not put data in this field. This is not a field for you to put data in. Q rules puts data in this field. So here's how the logic goes. You execute the Q rules command. Q rules finds your ID field that you've indicated via this X path, or it tries to. And if it can't find it, it's going to return you an error. Okay? Once it finds it, it's like, okay, this is a valid ID path. Then Q rules takes all of your repeating items and it generates what's called a camel batch, C-A-M-L. And we use a camel query to uh, update list items in the update list items method for the list web service. That's what it takes for one of its parameters is this camel query in order to add these items or update items or delete items in your SharePoint list. Upon successful execution of that operation, of that method, update list items, SharePoint returns XML data in the web service. In that returned XML data, we can find out whether or not there were any errors. And the other thing we can find out is we can find out the, the IDs, the SharePoint list item IDs of all of these items that were just added. So if we go look, um, I'm in the different kind of a section here. Hang on one sec. Okay, so if we go to this particular list, it doesn't have any items in it right now, but the ID field is displayed there. Um, every single list item in SharePoint has a unique ID to that list. If you're SQL familiar, an ID column is going to be an auto-incrementing integer. So this one is nine. This means at some point we've had eight other items here and this is our ninth item that's been added. IDs never get reused. They're always unique. They're always incrementing. If we delete item nine, we'll never have another one ever, ever, ever. No matter what, it's going to go to ten next. Okay? And so these are an auto-incrementing integer. Now, if I have that ID, if I know that this item is ID 9, then it's easy for me to find it and make updates to it or find it and delete it. And that's what Q rules does with the information that you've provided it. So if you tell Q rules that you've got an ID field, here's the X path to it, and if Q rules then populates that with the SharePoint list item ID, for the newly created item, then going forward, if you want to update that item, Q rules can do that for you because you've got an ID in that field. If you want to refresh it, Q rules can do that for you. If you want to delete it, that's part of the refresh command, and Q rules can do that for you. So that's what the ID is for. You don't always need it. Some people use InfoPath for kind of a set it and forget it method uh, with a SharePoint list. Somebody opens up the InfoPath form, maybe it pulls in and copies over some data from a SharePoint list, they make edits, they hit submit, it closes the InfoPath form, and items over in the SharePoint list have been updated. 
That's perfectly valid and acceptable. It just means that you need to know, once again, as I go marching down my path, harping on, you know, plan first, design second. But it does mean that you need to know the intent of your form. You need to know the intent of your audience. You need to know uh, what's the end goal. What are you trying to do? What do you need to build? Right? We, we, don't go, we don't go and build houses without a plan. And so if you know these things in advance, then you'll know whether or not you need to include an ID field. If you need to be able to run updates and deletes from your form, from your XML, if you need to be able to refresh the data in your XML with your list data, then you need to use the ID parameter. Not the parameter. You need to at least map it. Sorry, it used to be a parameter, now we can map it, but regardless, you need to include ID in some way, shape, or form. We'll take a look at that. Uh, refresh SharePoint list items requires that you're using an ID, whether it's mapped or a parameter. It has two modes. One is update, the other is report. Report is the default mode. Don't be like me and forget that. I forget that every time I use Refresh SharePoint list items. And I think to myself, huh, nothing's updating in my form. Why aren't my things being refreshed? But Report Mode simply returns to the Result node a list of the items that are different from the last time that the form submitted to the SharePoint list. The reason we defaulted to Report is because we would like to default to not changing data. We want to make sure you know what's going to happen before you click, you know, before you let this actually update your XML data. So you, you have to actually set mode equals update. Now, your ID node, the, the node in your form that you've indicated you're going to use for your SharePoint list item ID, has to have an attribute on it of Q rules last modified. What we use that attribute for, when we go to refresh items, we're not comparing field to field. Okay. What we're doing instead is we're saying, when does SharePoint say this item was last modified? Great. What's the Q rules last modified date on this item? Great. Which one's newer? Okay. And so it's a very simple comparative. We, we, uh, when we write to the ID and when you use submit to SharePoint list, we update the Q rules last modified field. And that's what we compare to the last modified in SharePoint to figure out whether or not your item in your form needs to be refreshed. So hopefully this was enlightening and not uh, causing greater confusion. It is a complex command. The two commands in tangent are complex. Uh, used together, you can get a pretty powerful uh, info path to SharePoint connection going on. So, so it can be extremely useful to you. It, it is complex, and there's um, and while we've tried to simplify the command in 4.2, there's only so much simplification that can happen. There's a lot of moving parts. So um, let's talk about how we're going to map parent fields when dealing with repeating data and a child. And I'm going to pop over to a virtual machine because, um, no, you cannot restart Windows. What do you think? Just be one second here while I convince Windows that it's not going to be restarting. Postpone. Boy, I like the little blue spinny circle of death. Um, we'll wait until that responds. So I've got on my uh, my main dev box right now, I'm running InfoPath uh, 2013. In fact, I'm running Office 2013. Uh, I really like Outlook a lot in 2013. I didn't at first, but now I'm getting used to it. However, it's helped me find uh, some bugs. And one of those bugs is indeed with this tool. Um, Oh, good, now I can postpone you. Great. Now it's responding. One of the bugs is with the InfoPath to SharePoint list tool. Um, when you attach a uh, source XSN file, it will, um, it will fail, and the, the schema tree will fail. So one thing that's new from, I believe, 4.2 is the ability to import an existing mapping. And I'm going to go ahead and, and import a mapping. I've got this one hanging out on my... Uh, on my desktop. Let me just see if I can find my desktop. And I hope it's not too embarrassing. Gee, what do you know? It is embarrassing. Let's go ahead and click. My virtual machines are even worse than my regular machine. And I need to sign in. And off we go. So importing an existing mapping is useful. It saves you some time. Okay, you don't have to uh, start over again on your mapping. You know, we used to suggest, well, do file save as in the form and, and just save it. But now it's much easier because you can just go ahead and grab that mapping from your, uh, from your template, uh, save it out, 
and then you can just import it. Um, if you have anything in this form when you import the mapping, everything gets overwritten and replaced. So if you did have your, your source XS in attached here, um, that would have been overwritten. So first off, here is uh, the, the change I was talking about with 4.2. I'm going to click show here to show all of these. So you have the option now of marking your ID. We've selected our ID here. Uh, let me just attach a file and move on from there. I don't want this to be too crazy pretend. Make it a little more real here. Navigate, navigate. There we go. So here we go. Now we've got our file attached and we can use our note picker. So I'm using a repeating group. It's group two. There we go. And here's our schema tree. Schema tree is the thing that does not work in uh, in the uh, 2013 right now, although it could be because I'm running 64-bit Office. So much to track down, so little time. So here's group two. I'm using a repeating group. I am mapping title, and you can see I've mapped it to my SharePoint column of title, and I've mapped value, and I've mapped that to my SharePoint column of description. And again, I'm using different names just to show that, that names don't have to be the same. So here's some of the newer stuff, and that is, here's my ID field. This guy right here is my ID field. You'll see he's got Q rules last modified as an attribute on him because I'm using this form in a refresh scenario. And so I can map the ID. I mark it as an ID and there's some guidance text here. And you don't actually map that to anything. We're simply indicating it's an ID. And also I'm indicating which my attach which field is my attachments field. Now this means when you use the submit to SharePoint list command and you have attachments, you no longer have to include an X path to your attachment field. Um, you do have to include the data source name for your attachments data connection. And we cover this stuff in the lab. So, so if I'm you know, if, if I'm not going into a ton of detail, you're going to get the chance to see these things when you walk through the lab. So what I was going to show you was mapping a parent item. So here we are, we're on group two. Right, and here's group two. We said this is our repeating group. I'm going to hide these options because that's in my way. Okay, and now what I want to do is I want to map this parent. So a scenario where you might be doing this would be um, if you had a form that was submitting to an orders list and it had order details, you might want your order number, right? Because, well, it just makes sense to have that in your order details, right? And it might even be a lookup. Okay, and so you would want to include that here in your mapping. But if you try to select parent, you get an error. It's not a child of group two. Manually add the field X path. So here's where you need to enter a, um, a relative path. So what is a relative path versus an absolute path? And we talk about this a lot when we talk about X path. And um, it took a little while for me to kind of make sense of it. So I tend to work on the assumption that it might take other people a little while too. And a relative path is when we state how do we get there from where we currently are. So I like to think of a relative path as driving directions. I'm currently in Adams, Oregon. How do I get to Kirkland, Washington? Right? And that's very relative. And it's going to be completely different from I'm currently in you know, Sacramento, California. How do I get to Los Angeles, California? That's a whole different set of directions than how do I get from here to there. Okay? So a relative path I think of as driving directions. I'm on group two. How do I get to my parent? Right? And an absolute path I tend to think of as like latitude and longitude, longitude. It's, it's a point on a map. It's, it's this is where the thing is. No matter where you are, this thing will always be here at this place. Okay? And that's helpful for me. may not be helpful for you, but if it is, I just wanted to share it. So here's where I want to go. I want to go to parent. I am currently here. I'm at group two. How do I get from group two to parent? Well, I need to go up my tree once. So I'm at group two, and I've gone up one level. That takes me up to group one. Okay, So I'm at group one, and I'm just going to collapse that. And that means, is my parent inside of group one? No, it's inside of my fields. That means I have to go up again. Now I'm at my fields. So from here, how do I get to my parent? Right? Just like that. Okay? And I don't actually have a field in my list that I can map that to. But that gives you the general idea. A relative path is driving directions from here 
to here. Okay, an absolute path to a uh, parent would have been something like Okay, that's the absolute path. That's, that's its point on the map. In this XML, how do I always find a parent? But what we need here is we need the relative path. Now, um, with 4.2 and greater, we can have multiple mappings inside the same mapping XML. If you were submitting a parent and then children, let's say you're submitting orders, and then you're submitting order details. If you were submitting a parent and then children, you would want to map these in order of appropriate submission. So map the parent first, then map the child. What Q rules will do is it will go through that mapping fold file in order. So the first list that's mapped gets submitted first. So let's think of a scenario, again, I'm going to go back to orders and order details, where in your order details you have a lookup and you want that lookup to be the parent item SharePoint ID. QRules submits all the orders in my mapping and then it's returning ID values to the field indicated as ID for orders, right? So now all of my orders have IDs. Now QRules is going to submit my second mapping in my mapping file and this time it's the order details. And so I could have a relative path to my SharePoint ID for my orders that's been populated now. I could have a relative path to that and in my second mapping as that's submitted, my second, my second mapping in my mapping XML as that's submitted, it will also then populate my lookup because I have that appropriate, I have that appropriate ID already populated. And I cover that in a blog post on 4.2 that I've got and when I'm gathering up some other links uh, while you guys work through the lab, I will, hey, virtual machine be nice. Wow, that thing's not being nice at all. Uh, as I gather those things up, uh, those other links up for you, I'll include, I'll include the link to, uh, to that blog post because I actually walk through this kind of you know, parent-child relationship and how to use that with these mapping files. Oh, and one more thing before you go off and, and work on this lab, um, just in case you haven't looked at one of these. Now, if you don't read XML, um, much, you know, you haven't looked at it much or you've only looked at it a little, it's something I'm going to encourage you to get familiar with looking at. I mean, the whole point of XML is really that it's supposed to be human readable. And when I was talking about references yesterday, that's why I was saying, well, I don't care if all of my date fields are named date as long as they're in appropriately named groups, right? If, if, it's, in, if it's in PO form accounting section date, then I know that it's the, the date the accounting section did whatever it is, right? And, and so um, you want to, you know, I encourage getting comfortable reading XML. Um, we can see here in this one, we've got a mappings node, and then inside of that, we've got uh, a list collection, et cetera, et cetera. And if we had multiple of these, let's pop back onto my virtual machine, and I'm just going to grab this guy, and then I'm going to click Save as QRules Mapping, and I'm just going to write him... Um, let me go ahead and put it back on my desktop. Might as well, yeah. And let's take a look at him. As I scroll through this mess, you thought yours was bad, and edit with Notepad++. I, I have a fondness for Notepad++ because it's got a plug-in for uh, highlighting, and I like my syntax highlighted. Okay, so now in this one, you can see we've got two mappings nodes. Right? There's, there's one for each. There's the single SharePoint list URL, which this is the URL for the SharePoint server, actually. So it's kind of a cruddy name. Um, and in these mappings, you can see there's one for each list. Uh, there's the option of using the list name. That's something new, I think, for 4.3. Um, and we include the list name so we can use it. Here's the GUID for the list. Uh, we indicate whether or not something's repeating. Um, this is mine, this relationship stuff. This hasn't happened yet. This is mine for future proofing. I, I intend to do something with that at some point in time so we don't have to uh, we don't have to map an order. But again, that's on the that's on the to-do list. 
And then here's each mapping. We've got the form field. Is it rich text? Is it the ID? Is it an attachment? Here's the relative path from the repeating group to that. And there's the SharePoint column name. And down here is batch stub. And this is what I use to create the batch and queue rules. So that's what a mapping file looks like. Um, I, before we added the before we added the functionality to the tool to import a mapping, I've been known to just make changes on those on my own rather than use the mapping tool. So we are at 10:15. I am going to give you guys 45 minutes for this lab. Um, it is uh, a longer one. It's more complex. It's got submit to SharePoint list. It's got submitting with attachments. It's got refresh from SharePoint list. And so I want you guys to have some time to go through it. I'll, I'll pause my screen sharing. I'll stop recording. Ask questions if you have them. I'll get some links gathered together and I'll pop those, uh, I'll pop those up on the window here at some point so you've got those and I'll pop them in the chat as well so that you can copy them a little more easily. And again, we'll, we'll, get, we'll pick up again at 11 o'clock for input parameters and transform, which is very exciting stuff. Okay? Okay, so we are at 11 o'clock. I hope um, everybody was able to get through these things. Um, Nancy, you had asked where does the Q rules link value get set? Um, that should be getting set after attachments are successfully added, it should be getting set then in your form if your file attachment field has a Q rules link, Q rules file name attribute. Uh, feel free to post your form. Uh, just go ahead and drop it in the lab file if you'd like me to take a look at it. During the next lab, I can take a peek uh, like we did yesterday when, when one of your forms was uh, giving you a little bit of a fit. So yeah, feel free to, to pop that up there and I'll take a look at it and let you know what's going on. Okay. Um, at any rate, I hope everybody had a chance to at least dig into the lab and, and get a feel for things. Um, the site will be up, the training site will be up for a while if you want to go back to it later today or next week or what have you. Um, I posted some links in chat that I had mentioned to you that might be helpful um, in order to kind of get you get you going with some of these things if you, if you need a blog post or if you have um, one of those special scenarios like a person group picker or something something like that. Some of, these, some of these links might be helpful. And I put them in chat as well because you can't copy them from my presentation. So moving on. Next we are going to talk about input parameters, which is one of my very favorite things, and transforms, which I, um, gosh, I love them and I hate them. And we'll talk about, we'll talk about why. So, first off, URL, uh, URL parameters or input parameters in InfoPath. This was added, I believe, in InfoPath 2007, the ability to pass in input parameters to a template. Um, most commonly, people use them in a URL. Um, so you would have a URL to your form template. Uh, you would end that URL with a, uh, with a question mark and then the parameter name equals parameter value and you can use uh, and symbols, ampersands, to, to group them together if you have multiple input parameters. Um, your InfoPath form then would either require code to return those values or Q rules has get input parameters and it will return the values for you from that URL that you pass in. Um, transfer, and, and you can also, I'm going to go back one, you can, also, you can also pass in input parameters via command prompt and I'm going to show you this because I think one problem with using input parameters in InfoPath forms is especially if you're a little insecure like I am when you're designing your forms and you want to make sure everything works. It gets a little tedious if you think that you have to use a URL to get that input parameter in there because when you make a change to your form then you are public publishing it and then you are you know trying with a URL and then you go back and you make changes and you try again and uh, you can save yourself some time hassle and headache by using command prompt to pass in your input parameters so we're going to walk through how to do that so you've got that um, another cool thing <laughs> well I guess depending on how prone you are to, to hazard and disaster is um, 
when you open your form from the command prompt passing in input parameters, it actually opens in InfoPath proper, not as a preview. And uh, what that means is that the template that you're opening gets cached in your InfoPath cache. And not that long ago, I had like a little mini, uh, mini meltdown and had to go find a view from my InfoPath cache because the cache will actually store all your form files. So um, in case you're ever in a total emergency, if you've been opening up a form uh, and actually opening it instead of previewing it, you can sometimes find your latest copy of the form files in your InfoPath form cache. Just <laughs> disaster preparedness advice. I make it sound like all I do is have disasters all day long, and that's really not the case. Sometimes I don't have disasters, but I like to prepare for them. Um, the other command we're going to look at in this next lab is transform. And the transform command is going to perform an XSL transform on data in any data source, and then it will store the results somewhere else in the form. We, we have several different options with this command in 4.3. We added even more. Um, you have your XSLT added as a resource file to your form. And we looked at adding resource files yesterday briefly when we were talking about XML data connections. The challenge with transform, as I was mentioning yesterday, the challenge with transform is learning how to write transforms. That is, um, well, that's a kicker. You know, with our XML data, one of the joys and beauties of, of raw data, such as your, your raw XML data, is you can display it any old way you want to, um, within, of course, the constraints of the data type and whatnot. But in InfoPath, if we look at our form files, let me just, I'm just going to, of course, I'm going to change slides accidentally. That's just what I do. If we look at our form files, let's go find uh, something that I saved as, form files, in fact we go to handy old temp, right, if we look at our form files, all of your views are XSL files, and those are just XSLTs that generate the view that you see when you open up your form, and, and that just dictates how you're going to see your data. So when, when I talk about transforming your XML using an XSLT, it's really, it's the same uh, it's the same concept as what InfoPath is doing with views. Now, generally speaking, when we're using a transform with Q rules, what we're, what we're generally doing is we're, we're probably changing quite a lot about the data. Uh, we might be taking values from one node in our source data and putting those values in a different node in our, in our target um, in our target data source. And that's kind of what we're doing in our lab. So, what what I'll do is um, what I'll do is we'll look at these input parameters using a command prompt, and then I want to show you uh, how to um, debug XSL or look at XSL in Visual Studio. There's other tools out there um, that are free. Not everybody I know not everybody has or uses Visual Studio. It's a development tool that that a lot of us probably don't run on our machines. Um, but there are free tools out there if you start looking for um, an XSL editor or uh, XSL applying transforms. What, what you need is, generally speaking, generally speaking, what I have found is that what I need in order to learn a new technology is I need a way to test what I'm doing so that I can see what the outcome is. And I never want to work blind, because if I work blind, then I'm not, I'm not going to see what's going on, and I'm not going to be able to, to figure out what's wrong. So that's why, uh, that's why I use Visual Studio and recommend you look into tools. If you want to learn how to write XSLT, look into tools that can help you run your XSL against your target XML so that you can see what the results are going to be. And once you, uh, once you start doing things out in the open where you can see your results, you'll find that you learn things a lot faster, you know, that things make more sense. I know when I started with InfoPath, a lot of times I couldn't, like, I couldn't figure out how to do a filter or something, and, and it would frustrate me. And then it would turn out that my secondary data source, the values were actually quite a bit different than what I thought they were, because say, for example, SharePoint was showing the date as, as month slash day slash year, and the date was actually year dash month dash day. You know, and once I started figuring out how to take a look at those data sources by dragging them onto the form and changing the format to XML value and so on, it, it made things much easier for me. So let's take a look at um, let's take a look at, at testing our input parameter logic with a command line. This link right here is uh, the uh, old InfoPath team blog, and it has information on 
using uh, input parameters, and it also has the information on the code you need to write to, to use those input parameters. And if you take a look at it, um, like so much of the code that we've got in Q rules, you'll probably be uh, surprised by it. Really, it's just a couple lines of code. It's not terribly complex. Um, so much of the things we need code for in InfoPath are not terribly complex. And so the syntax is, is uh, I've got it listed here. You hit your InfoPath EXE. Um, you pass in the uh, path to your form. In this case, they're using an XML. It's already been filled out and would have the um, information in the form header, the href for the template it used. And then you include your input parameters. And that's what they have listed up here. And we use the switch input parameters to show that we are passing in parameters. And then it's name value pairs after that, right? Separated by an ampersand. Um, if you decide, if you decide to write code for this yourself, uh, keep in mind that um, that InfoPath in the InfoPath is case sensitive for returning the key for your input parameters, but I have found instances where it changes the case on you, so you, you might want to keep an eye out for that. Let's take a look at running this from the command prompt. So, you know, I accidentally drug this up and I'd like to unpin it. That was a mistake. Okay, so I'm going to run my command prompt as admin. Okay. And so the first thing I need to do is I need to get to the directory for um, my InfoPath EXE. Now I think I've currently, I think I've got that listed correctly there and I've actually got this on a text file because um, because I'm kind of lazy. So here's the path to my office, my office folder, right? So you need that and CD is change directory and right click to paste Right. Okay, so now I'm located on my Office 15 file. If I start typing in InfoPath and tab, it pops up with InfoPath EXE. That's the EXE I need to run. So now here, the next thing I've got, this is the form itself, the input param demo that I'm going to that I'm going to open up. And here is my input parameter switch. I'm saying we're passing in input parameters. And here is the parameter value of test or the parameter key of test, and then my parameter value is going to be new test. Let's go take a look. Actually, let's run this first, and then we'll go take a look at the logic in the form. Okay, so I'm going to copy that. Actually, I don't need the info path piece. I'm going to try copying again. Copy that. All right, and I'm going to paste it and hit enter. Okay, and so this is going to pop my form right up. And you can see the value in field one right now is new test. So if I close this and pop this up again. Oh, by the way, you couldn't see what I did there, um, but I used the up arrow. And so when you want to rerun this, um, when you want to rerun your, your command, you just use the up arrow. And so if I'm working on something that uses input parameters, especially something that has any kind of complex logic where I'm going to be needing to run it again and again as I make changes, then usually what I do is I just keep the command prompt open and I just use the up arrow to rerun it. And then the big mistake that I usually make is rerunning it without actually having saved the changes I've made. So I would have the form open in design mode, I'd be working on it, and then without actually saving, I would reopen it again, which would of course not open with my changes. So let's go take a look at this in design mode. So we usually put input parameter rules on the finished loading node. The finished loading node, we added that to Q rules because of the fact that we have an order of operation issue. And the order of operation issue we have is that rules run before code in InfoPath. And that includes when you go and open your form. So on form load, rules run before code. Q rules is code that's activated by rules. You can probably see the chicken and egg problem we have right there. Now, I find that some rules run OK, Q rules commands run OK from form load, but I generally don't run Q rules commands from form load. I almost always run them from the finished loading node. The last thing we do when Q rules code initializes in the code behind is we set finished loading to true. And the reason we do that is to solve this chicken and egg problem so that you can have, um, you can have access to the input parameters that are being passed in and so on. So my rules are almost always here on finished loading and my rules usually have finished loading equals true. 
Okay, and so here's my get input parameter test, and my command is get input parameter key equals test. You can see here's the key I passed in was test. Okay, and then I'm setting field one to result. Now, as we discussed on Monday with 4.2, we've got a couple new fields, so I could change this rule so that instead of having to set field one manually to result, the command used the result x path uh, parameter and was setting field one for me at that point. And now I've got get other parameter, so I can add an other parameter, and I can set field 2 to that. So if I were to rerun this, I could use test string training, and my other parameter's name was other equals my other test. Let's try that. Now, I hadn't made any changes to the form, so I did not need to save. <laughs> okay, so you can see field 1 and field 2 are populated. And because of this, you can do things like um, if you combine this with, I want to say it's set default view. Let's go look. It's under form. Yes, set default view. So you can use this with set default view um, if you would like to change the view uh, based on a URL or an input parameter in a URL. And that can be kind of neat. You could have um, a form where there's a link in one SharePoint you know, site that HR clicks and it opens up a specific HR view of this form. And in another department, the link has a different URL parameter so that a different view opens. Okay, So that's just using it combined with set default view gives you a lot of, uh, a lot of leeway as far as what you can do with these parameters. So that's how to execute input parameters from the command prompt. And if you're using input parameters, I really recommend you do that because I think it's going to be, uh, I, I personally find it a lot simpler to debug, preview, and test than I, I will avoid publishing at all costs. I mean, I know I say publish early, publish often, you know, test all these things, unit test this, unit test that. But once I've tested out the stuff that I'm, that I'm sure could cause me a problem, I am not going to publish terribly often because I find publishing to be a little bit of a pain and I'm certainly not going to run off and be opening my form from its published location passing in different parameters. I would just so much rather use the command prompt. So let's take a look next at um, transforms. So what I do is I use, like I said, I use Visual Studio. There are other tools out there. There are free tools out there. Because I've got and I use Visual Studio, I don't have any deep knowledge about, um, about what tools to try. But I would encourage you to, you know, hop online and start looking around and just try a few different things. I think Microsoft even has a freebie hanging around. And I do not think... As of, I think, 2008 was the last time I checked the free versions of Visual Studio. It's like Visual Studio Express. And the last time I checked the free versions, I don't believe they included the XML tools. But that's also worth checking to see if that's changed with the newer versions. So, you know, it's something to keep an eye on. So I'm going to pop open um, an XSL. And it's, I'm going to open up this guy. This is the one we're using in the lab. Okay, and let's take a look at him. Okay, so we're stating that he is an XSL style sheet. We've got omit declaration equals yes. That is required um, at certain times in the Q rules transform command. And next we've got our template, uh, our template match. And so what we're looking for here is in the data source we're transforming, we're looking for this node. Okay, and then we're creating a node called my company name, and the value we're putting in there is the title from this node. Right? We've got a relative path here of title. I'm going to open up my source file, my source data file, so you can see. So I've created a sample file here. Right, and let me just split these up so it's a little easier. Okay, and oh, let me <laughs> let me switch them around. There we go. Okay, so on the right here, this is my XML. And this is my original XML that I am going to be transforming. Okay, and so I can see what the schema looks like. Right? I've got my fields, query fields, data fields. Okay, here's my, my SharePoint list item RWs. There's my, my repeating node, right? I'm matching on that repeating node. And then I've got a title, and here's some information there. And when I hit contact name, I'm going to create 
a new node with the my name space for contact name with this value. Phone number, I'm going to go ahead and when I find this phone number, I'm sorry, when I hit here, I'm going to put the value of that phone number in and I'll put the value of that email address in. And then I close up my node here of contacts. So when I go to use the transform command in key rules, usually what I do is I create a dummy XML that I can run my XSL against. And the way I usually start creating my dummy XSL is, I'm going to go ahead and extract this guy, is I go look in my sample data. So if we go look at our sample data here, <laughs> I've got my fingers crossed that this is the going to have the right connection. So if we go look at our sample data, the first thing we see is our my field. This is our, our root node for our main data source. And this has all of the stuff for our main data source in it. Then the next thing I've got is I've got some data connections. And every single data connection I have is going to be here in my sample data. And right here, this is the XML for that data connection. So my data connection's name is customers. Here's the XML for it. So what I will usually do is I will copy that XML out and I will create a new XML file with it. For the nodes that I plan on transforming, I will enter some dummy data, just anything, something realistic, but you know, just, just a value, so that they've got a value in them. And then that gives me something to run my transform against, because the transform command in QRules inside your form is going to be pretty opaque. You're not going to be really able to see what's going on with it. And if you can run your transform against sample XML that you know is accurate, prior to trying it in your form, your chances for success are going to be greatly improved. Okay, so let's debug this. Let's just go ahead and run this against. Here's our source XML. Here's our transform. And we're going to go ahead and start our XSLT debugging. And it asks me what my input's going to be. And here's my sample, right? And so here we just hit company name. I've got some white space in here. I'm not too concerned about that. So we just hit company name. So I'm going to jump over. And it wrote the start of the node. And it's adding the namespace, the my and the d namespace. And now it's written the sample title. right? And now it's closed company name. You can see the yellow highlight. We're on contacts now. Right? And started writing contacts. We're adding the namespace to everything. So this is a little messy but I'm not super concerned about it because um, I'm, just, I'm just transforming it for use in InfoPath. And then we should be done. There we go. And so here it is. Now this doesn't have a root node, and so it's going to, uh, it would have a problem as an XML. It's not considered to be valid XML because it, it has multiple root elements. However, for our purposes in our transform that we're going to do in the lab, it's fine because we're replacing a, we're not replacing a root node, we're actually replacing a child node. Okay, and so this at least lets me see what the results of my transform are going to be. And let me just, um, we go tidy that up a little bit so that we can read it a little better and so this lets me see what the results of my transform are going to be I can see whether or not I've got the XML that I anticipated getting um, if I don't have the XML I anticipate getting then I can make some changes and go from there um, W3 schools has okay XML and XSL training probably definitely worth um, let's just stop this because I know we all love the picture of the day but let's see um, W3 Three rules XSL, and I mean the W three school stuff can be uh, pretty basic, but you know what? That's okay because <laughs> if we start with the basics, then usually we kind of get the hang of of what we're doing, and and starting with the basics is a great way to get a good foundation. So I would um, I would definitely maybe check out something like the XSLT tutorial here on W3 Schools if you're unfamiliar and you'd like to get more familiar and more comfortable. I think that's a, a pretty good place to get started. Um, let me pop back over here. Okay, so you guys created a SharePoint list in Module 2. And in this input parameters and transform lab, I'm going to ask that you use that same list um, because everybody needs to create a, a SharePoint list form 
for editing their uh, their list items, and and that's part of the lab. And I don't want us all using the same list and overriding each other because that would be messy. Um, we'll get back together at about 11:50 just for a quick wrap up and any final questions, and to talk about the agenda tomorrow. And uh, Again, if you have questions, pop them up in the question box, and I'm going to pause things, let you guys work on that lab, and we'll meet back up here at um, 1150. Talk to you soon. Okay, well, I hope everybody had a chance to get through the lab on input parameters and transforms. Again, if you have any questions, if you got stuck on anything, um, let me know. I'm happy to help you. Um, and again, the site will be up for a while, so if there's something you want to go back, look at again, do that. Um, I encourage you to get comfortable with transforms. Um, some of the stuff we were doing yesterday, some of the uh, copy table exercises, could be done a lot more efficiently with a transform. Um, a person could write a transform to take their secondary data source, transform the data into the correct uh, schema, for their main data source and and replace the main schema notes with the transformed notes. And so if you're going to be doing a lot of data copying from one data source to another, um, I would really deeply encourage you to get comfortable with transforms and the transform command. And get input parameters, I just use that all the time. I, I love input parameters. They, they give me a great deal of flexibility. So tomorrow we'll be meeting again at um, nine o'clock. Uh, tomorrow we're going to, like I said, I looked at the slides for tomorrow. I think we've got plenty of time to uh, do both the term sets and the encrypt decrypt stuff. Um, we should have we should have room for both of those labs. And then we're also going to look at unique form naming and we'll wrap up with uh, just kind of an informational session on some best practices in browser forms so that everybody feels comfortable and prepared for using browser forms and and understand some of the issues they might run into there. So I hope everybody had a great day and I hope the rest of your day goes well and I will uh, talk to you again tomorrow. Again, here's my email address if you need anything or if there was something unclear and I look forward to continuing this tomorrow. Have a great day.